So there is so much going on at the moment uh, everywhere, I think, in financial planning. But one of the things that uh, we definitely need to have a look at and what we're going to do today is take a look at some updates on cross-border tax planning. And I am joined again by our resident tax, and I'm not going to call him a guru, he's so much more than that. But uh, Jochen van Seil is back, and I'm really looking forward to my conversation with him to get an update on all the things you would have seen. There's been a lot of articles in the media and uh, everybody's got their own views and opinions, but uh, we always go to Hichu to uh, get the latest. And uh, because they're on the ground and they deal with us every day, and in fact, he's dealt with us since a very, very long time ago. So uh, join us this morning. Looking forward to this, and uh, let's get the show started in the proper way. Good morning, all the way from Cape Town this morning. You would see I am not in uh, my usual studio, and uh, I'm finding myself in Somerset West this morning, and uh, yesterday was wet and cold and rainy, and this morning is uh, sort of something in between, <laughs> but I'm really loving the cooler weather, and uh, I think I was built for that. But anyway, warm welcome this morning. Thank you very much for joining us live. Really looking forward to my conversation with Hiko a little bit later. We have Nikki here from the FBI, so looking forward to having an update and hearing what the latest is. And then Norma is here. So Norma has some amazing things to share with us this morning as well, which I'll announce a little bit later. And then uh, I've got a couple of quick announcements, and then Nico and I will get into the conversation. But of course, don't forget that what can you do? You can win some coffee. So this morning I thought let's uh, combine coffee and tax. Why not? You know, there is no such thing as coffee tax. I think it should be coffee rebate or something, but hashtag coffee tax. That's the hashtag for this morning. So if you would like to win some uh, coffee at the end of today's show, then uh, just comment in the comments, uh, hashtag coffee tax. You can do it on its own or you can add it to any other comment that you do but you will be entered automatically into the draw. So there you go. Hashtag coffee tax. All right. So uh, happiness. Then let me say a warm good morning before we get the show started. Uh, just a massive thank you for joining us this morning. Really appreciate it. Ferdi was up even before the sun was up in Bloemfontein. Ferdi, good morning. Johan Potgieter, good morning. Nice to see you. And then like the person who has watched the show from most places in the world, and from places he probably wouldn't share with us sometimes. But uh, Kuebis, good morning, all the way from Japan this morning. So uh, welcome. Thank you very much. He's still walking around and making sure Krista is happy as well. So thank you very much. Then uh, Renee, good morning. Nice to see you as well. I'm going to see some of you very shortly in person. Uh, Albert, good morning. Nice to see you. Happy birthday. If I don't uh, have got that wrong, you had a birthday this week. Uh, so uh, happy, happy. Then Elming, good morning. Nice to see you. Mr. Neil Phillips here in Cape Town. You know what the weather is like. Good morning. Greg Finch, good morning. Nice to see you here. Thank you very much. Uh, Mel, good morning. Hope you're doing well. Uh, I've got Brian, who I got to see in person when I was speaking at Old Mutual Wealth this week. So thank you very much, Brian. Awesome, awesome. Shemaine, good morning. Nice to see you. We've got Frank Ogliotti in the house. Uh, Mr. Gentleman himself. And... Uh, Lizette, good morning. Yes, Lizette. Okay, I spoke to you yesterday, Lizette. Uh, Harry, good morning. Nice to see you. We've got Tracy. We've got Tinas. I've got to go a little bit quicker. <laughs> this is awesome. Mark Weston Ford, my friend. I had a catch up with you before I came to Cape Town. That's amazing. Uh, so good stuff. And then we've got some hashtag coffee taxes coming through. Uh, fantastic. Uh, Neil says uh, hashtag coffee tax is the only tax I like. Yes. <laughs> I don't, and you don't even have to submit a return or anything like that. Joseph, good morning, all the way from the Free State. Nice to see you. And then uh, we've got that there and uh, lacquer. Right, ladies and gentlemen, let's get the show on the road. As you can see, I'm very excited and energetic. Always happy to have Hiku in the house. Uh, always sad when I come to Cape Town. He's not here, though. Uh, but uh, one of these days, we will run into each other in person again. So 
with that, over to Nikki with the latest on current affairs. And I'm pretty sure there's quite a few things that uh, she needs to share with us this morning. Good morning, everybody, from a very cold and windy Johannesburg. Um, it seems that the cold front is on its way here because it is no fun outside this morning. So uh, there were two big news stories um, from yesterday. Firstly, if you don't know by now, the South African Reserve Bank has hiked its repo rate by another 50 basis points. This is taking the benchmark rate to 8.25%, which is the steepest level since 2009. And in turn, that meant that the rand hit a new record low of 19 rand 78 against the US dollar just after 9 p.m. SA time. And that was following this announcement of Saab earlier. It weakened over 2.7% on the day. This is the 10th repo rate increase in 18 months. And this takes the prime lending rate of commercial banks to 11.75%. The increase comes a day after the release of inflation data, which shows that the consumer price index cooled to 6.8% in April. Now, while inflation may be showing signs of abating, it is still hovering about the Saab's target band of 3 to 6%, and food price inflation is still in the double digits. Let's hope this is the turning point and that we don't need any further increases because my bond um, payment is getting really, really, <laughs> really big at this point in time. So holding thumbs that next time Saab will give us a bit of relief. Then in other big news, and it's something that sort of slipped under the radar yesterday afternoon, um, is that after three years of deliberations, the National Health, National Health Insurance Bill passed through the National Assembly Portfolio Committee on Health this week, with hardly a change made to the original version and the threat of legal challenges hanging in the air. So what this bill aims to do is to establish universal health care for, for all South Africans by abolishing the two-tier system in which the bulk of the healthcare spending happens in the private sector, while the mass of the population is relegated to the underfunded public sector. A single NHI fund managed by the state will buy healthcare services from both public and private sectors, free to the public at point of delivery. Now, what does this mean? This bill will now proceed to the National Assembly for processing. It will also need to be passed by the National Council of Provinces, which is likely to require that provincial, oh, and there goes my power, which is likely to require that provincial public hearings be held, making it at least a year before it gets through to the parliamentary process. Now, lobby groups remain hopeful that there will still be scope for amendments to the bill as it proceeds through parliament. And key among its concerns is the future of medical aid schemes. Now, how it will work is that it is envisaged that the NHI will be phased in over several years, offering an expanding bundle of services as, the, as time goes on. So as this services expands, medical aids will shrink. By the time it is fully phased in, the schemes will only be allowed to offer cover only for complementary services. This has raised concerns that this will dramatically shrink the pool of medical aid contrib contributors who will not want to pay twice for medical insurance. It will also shrink the private sector industry because it will no longer be viable. Um, we all know what the issues were with the bill in the beginning, and it seems that really none of those were addressed in the one that were passed now through Parliament. But there are also unresolved legal issues with the bill. In March, the committee received two conflicting legal opinions. The first one from the state law advisor said that the bill did not infringe on constitutional rights. The second, which was done by Parliament's own legal services, actually flagged several areas in which the bill could face legal challenges. And among these was Section 33, which would fundamentally alter the role of medical schemes. If medical scheme users were to experience reduced access to healthcare, 
this would actually violate their right to health as provided for in the constitution. Now, some of our trade unions, people like Solidarity, has already said that it would certainly challenge the bill in court, as well as the DA and the EF, or the Freedom Front have also, not the EFF, the Freedom Front have also previously said that legal challenges to the bill would follow suit should it remain unchanged from the original formulation. So um, some commentary is that Parliament is trying to push this through just in time for um, the elections next year. How this is going to play out is anyone's question, and I would suggest we keep a very, very, very close eye on what is happening here because it is directly affecting our business as well as those of our clients. Now, um, on that note, given that I only gave you bad news so far today, something else worthy of noting, today is National Wine Day. Did you know that South Africa is the eighth largest wine producer in the world and the world's largest, sixth largest exporter of wine? The country produces 1.3 billion liters of wine annually, with 81% of it being cons consumed domestically. So there is a bit of uh, um, information that you did not need to know, but now you do. So thank you, everybody. Enjoy a wonderful weekend. Stay warm. And also remember that you only have a few days to finish your CPD for the 22-23 cycle. So if you are not up to date yet, you have a weekend to sit down and finalize your CPD requirements. Thank you very much, Francois, and have a wonderful weekend. Thank you, Nikki. I don't know if I should say thank you, but uh, yeah, there was a few things in there that I was not aware of. So thank you so much for sharing that. It's so valuable, uh, you know, getting these updates in just five minutes. So thank you very much. And thank you to the Financial Planning Institute as well for your contribution to this. So Norma's uh, topic this morning is going to sort of then carry on from here because like so apt, because now that you know you've got a weekend, if you're not up to date with your CPD, Norma is about to talk about embracing what is so let's head on over to norma and hear what she has to share with us today good morning uh excited for my topic uh again today so what i want to talk about is embrace what is so I think when we all, and we all have experienced this before, is when things go our way, we get what we want, we achieve those goals, then it's easy for us to embrace what is and just accept where we are. But it's hard for, for those times that we are maybe not in the place where we think we should be, where things don't go our way, then it's a little bit harder to accept where we are. So I think when we don't embrace or we accept where we are, we go to this place where we think something has gone wrong. Maybe we say to ourselves, I should be further along. I shouldn't be here right now. And when we do that, we are basically just keep stuck where we are. We, um, I think we compare. We look for evidence that what we're doing isn't working. And also we waste time and energy on you know, spending more time and a focus on where we don't want to be than where we want to be. So how I see this embrace where we are, um, what it means to me is that everything is exactly the way that it should be. And how do I know that? Because it is. I think we don't necessarily have to, ex um, well, we have to accept it, but we don't necessarily have to like it or think it's good or right. But when we fight against it, and we think it shouldn't be that way, then we take all this energy and this possibility that we can use towards moving into the right direction, we take our focus away from that. So nothing has gone wrong and everything is exactly the way that it's supposed to be. So I think this, and I've experienced this in my own life, and I think this is, if we think this way, it serves us so much better and it brings us a whole lot of things. I wanna just mention a couple. So I think we spend a lot of time thinking about the things that's working instead of those that's not working. Um, I think we then immediately drop into that place of acceptance. And once we accept it, now we're in a place where we can say, okay, now what? 
So when we're in that place of now what, we look at the facts of the situation. So we don't think about or we, we become aware of the story we tell ourselves. Um, and then we can distinguish what is facts and what is the story we tell ourselves. So then um, let me give you an example, for instance. So if I say, for instance, in my business, my business is failing or this relationship is a total mess. Um, it doesn't have to be like that because that's not the facts of the situation. When I get rid of all the descriptive words, what, what I'm left, left with is, for instance, um, I'm currently in my business X amount of money year to date. Or um, when I say my relationship is a mess, it might just be my spouse forgot to take out the trash or my spouse forgot my birthday. So now that I know what the facts are, now I'm in a position to tell myself or to think about what am I making this mean? So if I make it mean my business is failing or I make it mean this relationship is a mess, that's not something that's serving me. So I have to go to that place where I actually have intentional thinking. I, I deliberately um, think about how I want to see the situation. So I want to see the situation in the business example, for instance, saying, you know what, how, how can I get that number a bit higher or how can I get that number to X? In my relationship is I'm thinking, you know what? It, there must be something big happening, for instance, in that person's life to have forgotten my birthday. I wonder what's going on for them. Maybe I should support them a little bit more. And then once I've given that situation meaning, now I'm in a place where I can have compassion, I can have curiosity, I may be inspired or committed to this cause. And now that I'm in that place, I can go and take action so I can see, I can evaluate the situation. You know, what is working? What's not working? What can I maybe do differently? And then I'll, I'll get to the result or the outcome that I see possibility. I see what I'm doing is working. I see evidence of what I'm doing is working. So next time something happens that maybe you don't like, that isn't exactly what you, where you planned, you, you, you want it to be at a specific point, think of nothing has gone wrong and I'm exactly where I'm supposed to be. Thank you. Uh, thank you for being here and listening. You'll see the QR code on the screen that Francois will be putting on soon. That QR code is for you to book a call with me. So if you're curious about coaching or you maybe don't even know what coaching is all about, maybe you've heard people talk about it, I invite you to go to that link, click on the link, book a call with me, and all your questions um, can be answered. Um, I think coaching is a great way for especially business owners to have a person sitting there with them listening, uh, maybe pointing out things that you might not necessarily see because it's so hard for us being in our lives to think of things you know, in, in a way that might be serving you because we always go to that worst case scenario. So I invite you, click on that link, book a call with me, and all your questions will be answered and you can stop wondering what coaching is all about. Thank you for your time. I'll be back uh, again next week. Brilliant stuff. And of course, Lalani is first out of the gate with a joke going like, uh, stop whining, start whining. Um, so and then I see loads of you followed with that. So uh, amazing stuff. Thank you very much, Norma. Really uh, appreciate that. It was a great session. So uh, quick announcements. Let's do it quickly. Alrighty, so uh, as you know, uh, the month of May is sponsored by Amity Investment Solutions. So thank you very much to Marius, Ian, Tanya, and the team over at Amity for keeping us on the air and making sure that things uh, we can do some new stuff. So thank you very much. And uh, of course, as you know, the coffee giveaway is all sponsored by Colombo Coffee and Tea over in Durban. Uh, so really go check out their website and order your coffee from there if you want. Uh, they are really be, they've been supportive since the start of this uh, season and we've given away a lot of coffee uh, and today is going to be no exception. So if you are interested 
to uh, go into the lucky draw at the end. We're going to do this. There's a whole system that does the draw. Hashtag coffee tax. Make sure you spell it correctly. Otherwise, the system won't pick it up. But hashtag coffee. You can see there's already 10 or so people that are in the draw. So thank you very much. But simply in any comment or just by its own comment, hashtag coffee tax. All right. So sound like a broken record. Let's move on. So the first announcement that I do want to do is next month. Well, not next month, next week. We're launching a brand new series that we're going to do. And that series is going to run every first Friday of every month until the end of the year. And uh, some of you may have seen that I've posted on LinkedIn quite a while ago asking for people who are new to the, to the profession and there's uh, between one and five years of experience. So I was so, uh, I won't say inundated, but is that <laughs> the right word? But so many of these uh, people got in touch with me and I had a, a meeting with everybody and heard their stories. And it was just so phenomenal that I thought, like, I can't just interview one or two or three of them. I've got to interview all of them. So uh, that's what we're going to do. Uh, so every first Friday of the month, uh, I'm going to uh, interview three of them and uh, looking forward to that, to hear their stories and their journeys. And in my mind, this is what I'm seeing, right? It's almost like a, a fellowship of the ring or it's like a... I don't know, like a, a Star Wars kind of thing, right? So these are the future heroes. These are the people that's going to take our profession forward. But they need guides like us. They, we need to know what are they struggling with. We need to know what they find exciting about the profession and all those good things. So I'm going to get into all of that with them uh, live here on the show every first Friday of the month. So uh, I, I can't decide on a name yet. So if anybody's got names for the series, I've been thinking, I've, I've written down a few. But if you've got any suggestions for that, uh, pop them in the comments. Uh, what can we call that series? Uh, so it's all people. That's nothing to do with your age, by the way. It's people who are new to the profession with uh, more than a year's experience and less than five years experience. So uh, there's some amazing people that you're going to hear about. Like all of them are really amazing. My, my mind was blown to, to hear their stories. So do look out for that. Next week would be the first one that we are going to do like that. All right, so that was that one. Then, uh, obviously, there's the session about two pots uh, that we're going to unpack, Michelle Acton and myself. Uh, Michelle is uh, the executive for retirement reform at Old Mutual. Phenomenal. Uh, as I said to you last week and in the emails and everything that, you know, I thought two pots is just, yeah, yeah it's not, not a big thing until I dove really deep into this uh, with people like Michelle and I really got to see, whoa, this is a big thing. And long term, this is a big thing. It's something that's going to impact the way we give advice and the advice that we need to give significantly. So uh, we got Michelle to do a session. Uh, I'm going to be talking with her. She's going to delve into that and uh, highlight a couple of things. And then I'm also going to share seven opportunities from this for financial planners. It's all, all in, happening in Propulsion. So if you're not a member of Propulsion, you can consider joining uh, but this is a propulsion member only session. So uh, you are very welcome to to go look at propulsion and see if it's something you would benefit from uh, because it's so much more than just these sessions. But the link is down below uh, so you can go check it out. All right. So then the last one is the day of CPD. Uh, now that the Global Financial Planning Conference is done, all the certificates have been sent out yesterday as promised. Uh, so the next session that's up is the... Uh, it's the day of CPD happening on the 12th of July. So 12th of July. So we will be uh, sending the agenda very shortly. And uh, also for those of you that didn't get tickets to Global Financial Planning Conference, where this was included in your ticket, you would be able to purchase access to that as well if you wanted to do that. All right. So day of CPD happening on the 12th of July. I'll, I'll share a little bit more about that. Uh, as we get closer to that, but uh, definitely something that you want to come and join us for. It's uh, an exciting day full of CPD, but fun. It's uh, it's exciting, you know, it's a variety. So come and join us. All right. Then the last thing is, yes, the summit is going to happen. I'm committing here right now. It, it's not on my list to say, but I've been pondering whether I'm going to do the propulsion summit in August. And I did decide, yes, I'm going to do it. So uh, do look out for that. Uh, we are another just a morning of just incredible information and discussions around the profession. So that is coming up as well. All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, if you like what we do, please, or you like this particular video, please hit the like button. And if you find value from what it is that we do, please subscribe to the channel. We've grown significantly in the last week or so. Thank you very much for all of those who subscribed. 
Uh, and please, I think the most important thing is tell others about the show, share this with, with others and uh, enjoy. So uh, with that, uh, let me just have a quick word from Amity before we get to the conversation with you. Mr. Van Sale, welcome back. This is your third return to the show. I think you've been on every single season. So warm welcome back. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Awesome. Hello, you know, it's amazing. It's amazing to think like, you know, the first time you and I met, I think it was by chance at a FISA meeting. And then uh, many, many years ago, 2018 or something or 2019, I think. And then uh, interviewed you on the podcast back then. And from there, we just, you know, got to know each other better and, you know, like, as you know, you're the go-to person. Uh, if anybody asks me anything, if, if I just hear ta, I haven't even heard the X yet, then I just go, Yichu. <laughs> so, Yichu, thank you so much for your time. Uh, thanks for, for all the great work that you do. Um, I know the clients and, and the people that we've referred to have all come back and said, like, just thank you. Um, so amazing. So, so just from our side, thank you. Like, you know, that's what propulsion is about. And, and it's, it's fantastic to have you part of the team. Thank you, Francois. And, and I mean, indeed, you've propulsed my practice as well, because that first one was um, shared so often. And I saw that the other day on one of the social medias, um, the subsequent one was uh, shared again. So, yeah, it's like the longevity of it is amazing. Thank you. No, it's amazing. But it's because you do things in the right way, with the right reason, and the right intent, as we always say from our side, Ihu. So, so that's absolutely amazing. For those of you who don't know Ihu, uh, Ihu uh, is a... Just, I think the way I can explain it is like it's like a walking encyclopedia, and it's not like Ihu always knows everything, but Ihu knows where to go if he doesn't. But the chances are, if you ask Ihu, that I've never asked a question that he hasn't been able to answer immediately and with confidence and with examples. So, uh, Ihu has, uh, Ihu, when did you uh, emigrate your very first client? 1993, March of 1993, and it was my own business partner after the murder of Chris Hani. Sure. Yeah, I was at a, uh, in, in, in the prime of my youth in matric in that year. So <laughs> absolutely amazing. But um, it just shows you how, how long you has been around. Um, you could just very simply maybe just share, because I know there's been a lot of changes uh, in your world as well. Uh, so before we get to the main conversation today about immigration and all that, <clears throat> uh, but just maybe give us a bit of background again on what it is you do and sort of the services you provide, et cetera, before we get into the conversation, just so people got a bit more of context about who you are and what it is you do. Thank you. So way back in uh, 2003 in London, I got the nickname Vachkaner. Um, I used that for a brand for a while, and we have now dropped that as a brand. I still have that nickname, but we're not going to use it as a brand anymore. So our brand names are now Tax Forum, and we have the Tax Practice, and then together with my business partner, a lawyer, Matthijs Brius Lowe in Stellenbosch. We started Tax Forum Fiduciary Services that looks after trusts and providers of services to trust in terms of this new FIC Act um, and the requirements to report. And then we have a, twin, a company called 22. They now take care of all the Forex and Forex transfers. So uh, it's no longer part of Tax Forum, but I still own part of that company. And uh, Matthijs and I just celebrated one year together, and it's really going well. Thank you, Francois. Yeah, that's brilliant. Thanks. Uh, sorry, man. It's a little bit difficult when you only have one screen in front of you and you can't see everything happening. You're, that, that's the bad thing about traveling. But uh, we're still here. We're on air. That's the most important thing. But but thanks very much, Ihu. I mean, let's let's get a little bit into the conversation. And I guess top of mind for a lot of people would be the, the, the changes. And I will never forget when I saw this... Uh, sort of first article uh, that came out around this and how sneaky SARS was to do it. I think it was on just before on a long weekend or something just before. I can't remember exactly the circumstances, but now they've got Monday, this new Monday system. The 24th, before the 27th. Yeah. 
Yeah. yeah. So 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 they sneakily, like you know, as if as if they were working on this and nobody knew about this. Um, but I mean, what is this change that really came about, and 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 what do you think is the is the practical impact? Because it is about understanding how something works is one thing, but the other part is how does this work practically? You know, it's one thing to say, oh, you, we, we, we're dropping the formal immigration process or the old immigration process that you had to go to the Reserve Bank and SARS, and now it's just the SARS process. Um, and they bring in these system changes and, pro, and, and application changes. But then, you know, like, how does that work practically? So if we can maybe start with the, oh, what is the change that, that happened? How was it before? And what did they change? And then what does it mean practically? So first of all, as you correctly said, um, formal immigration, or some people refer to it as financial immigration, was switched off uh, March 2021, but it was announced in February 2020 in the budget speech. And the change in process at SARS, so there's no rule change in 2023, it's a process change that took place in 2023, and that now aligns the SARS system with the announcement the minister made. And we all forget that at the time of the budget speech, there was... Um, a declaration by in the form of a circular issued by the South African Reserve Bank, that ex-con or exchange control circular, which said that henceforth a South African resident and non-resident will be treated equally. And that is one of the big changes that we see now, that we are now treated equally. And the pain we see is that now everybody has to provide their international balance sheet, the non-South African assets. Where at the past, for the interim period, SARS was on a risk basis. So if you applied for an approval to transfer money out, or we now call it approved international transfers, some people just refer to the TCS international transfers. In the past, you did not need to always provide the international balance sheet. High net worth individuals had to, or people that were directors or own businesses. It depended on your tax profile. So if you had to file a tax return with a balance sheet, then typically it came back and said, for your approval for FIA, we need your international balance sheet. But for those who were not obliged to file a balance sheet on tax return date, often SARS only asked your South African assets or just source. So that was the first change. So it feels like additional information, but what SARS now have done is that everybody applying has to apply for that. The biggest change that came is the certainty, and that I congratulate SARS on. In the past, we had a period that you could tax immigrate on your tax return. You ticked a box and you had a tax return immigration. Or you could do the RAV update and you did a RAV immigration. Now, SARS has come to the process and said, aligned to that 2020 announcement, you first do a tax immigration RAV process only. So that's a process where you log on to SARS, you tell them you've tax immigrated, you put a date in, they immediately send you an inquiry and they ask for certain documents. The outcome is a letter that says you have tax immigrated. It's very similar to the old letter that the Reserve Bank used to issue. But here comes the difference. That balance sheet that you now submitted to SARS is then sent to the Reserve Bank, where in financial immigration times, you first filled in the MP336, Bank stamped it, and then you gave it to SARS. So the flow information is different. A lot of people have an issue with and say it's a contravention of POPIA or POPI Act. It's not really. Because now when your PIN comes out, that PIN letter, your balance sheet South African assets are listed. And at this stage, I know some people still have the international assets listed, but we understand that they're soon going to switch that off. Your South African assets must be listed. Because in the exchange control manual, it says that your assets listed with SARS on immigration is freely remittable, subject to a good standing. So the Reserve Bank needs to know what used to be on the MP336. And those big um, economists who went off and said, now, you know, now there's information shared that should not have been. We all forget that up to 21 March or 1 March 2021, when you did financial immigration, your balance sheet was on your tax immigration clearance. It was listed. Then from that period until 24th of April, it was not there. And then often the banks came to me and as the person who filed and said, I had to do a sworn affidavit of what was the assets on that list. Okay. It is very important that we do understand that we are just going back to that process. 
And yeah, the new one was now the international assets, as I said, now applicable to everybody. The other very important part is that now in the old days, everybody had to do the TCS PIN, Tax Immigration Clearance Certificate. Now only people who want to do an international transfer need to do it. If you're an expat sitting in Dubai, where I am at the moment, and you're not sending money out of South Africa, you're in fact sending money into South Africa, but you just want that money tax-free, and the transfer is not really taxable, it's the salary year that we earn that needs to be tax-exempt or partly tax-exempt, or totally tax-exempt if you tax immigrate. We need that letter. And that letter is just adequate that there is no tax, and you can then tell the Reserve Bank or your bank when you send the money in, it is after tax. Okay, so very important. The TCS pin is only required if you want to send money out. The other part, and I'm nearly finished with the summary, that's not changed, okay, but now we feel the change. Is that the Reserve Bank manual since 2021 has read that if you have tax immigrated, the post-immigration income up to 10 million can leave with a good standing. So very important, I have lots of clients who come to me and said, I need a international transfer approval, the AIT, to send my living annuity out. No, no, relax. Get the letter and your living annuity can leave without a every year AIT or the replacement of an FIA. It's never FIA. It is always freely remittable income up to 10 million rand. So there we need a good standing and that can be done very easy. Two minutes. Fantastic. Thank you, Ihu. Um, My coffee, thanks. <laughs> yes, before it gets, well, it's so hot in Dubai, I don't think your coffee ever gets cold, right? Um, <laughs> so, um, I mean, there's, there's there's a lot of information and things to, to consider there. Has there been anything in this since the change came in in March that you see people are really struggling with or where there's always something that, you know, it's sort of not, it goes and then it sort of gets stuck in a place and then, or is things really flowing? And I'm not talking from a SaaS point of view, I mean from a client point of view. No, no. Uh, yeah, from a client and tax practitioner point of view, can I quickly use this to rant? Yes. <laughs> I get so annoyed with my dear colleagues who do not interpret law correctly. Okay. SARS says your balance sheet post-immigration, if you now, remember, you now have your letter. Now I want to take my retirement annuity. I want to encash it 100%. Now it says my balance sheet at base cost. Now they submit the same balance sheet that they submitted a year back on their tax return. Wrong. Remember when you tax immigrate, you pay base, uh, capital gains tax on your, you pay capital gains tax on market value on certain assets, not on immovable property, but shares, private shares, listed shares. That's an immediate step up in base cost. So the market value on the day of immigration or the day before, Section 9, H, capital H is the day before, that is base cost. So now they get annoyed because SARS rejects and says your balance sheet doesn't align or they query things on your balance sheet. It's our own mistake because we have not done the step up. Okay. And very important is that they do mention it on the SARS webpage, but on the form you fill in, they don't ask for it again. But in the explanatory document, they say, please provide us proof or a calculation of your exit tax three years back, five years back, 10 years back. We just want to see that you indeed paid the exit tax. And now we see a lot of penalties, and that's the other rant. We must not forget VDP process. And if the client has not done the exit tax. Just file the VDP and give me the VDP number. Then I can continue with the international transfer process. Because the minute you have the VDP number, you are protected. But if I file that application and SARS then send you a letter and said, we can't see you've paid the exit tax, then unfortunately you're in for understatement penalties. So don't blame the new international transfer process. It's always been law. If you do VDP and you have the number, you are protected because you have to declare that SARS was not sub, you were not subject to an audit or verification. Now, interesting, is an international transfer audit as the VDP refers to? Probably not, but I just feel get that VDP number, then you can process that later because it's a two, three, four week process. But I need for the AIT process to say to SARS, you have paid it.
Yeah, and just to be clear, so VDP is voluntary disclosure program, right? Yeah. So that's where I haven't done something. Sorry, guys. Like, you know, it's sort of saying, it, I would say admitting guilt, but he's definitely just saying, you know, look, <clears throat> I'm out of my own accord coming to you and saying I want to fix my things. And Before, uh, they, sure that I'm in before good. they raise the query. Yeah, because if, if SARS comes to you first, there's no VDP. Okay, only penalties and problems. So um, so definitely something uh, f from from that point. Um, the, you know, if I think about all of all of this, I mean, is this a better process? Maybe just from from your point of view, it's maybe I don't know if it's a fair question, but is this a better process from what we had before? So, if people wanted to emigrate or send money offshore, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, I mean, like, is this in fact better than what we had before? Yes, the practical example. Remember when formal immigration was switched off? We went to a three-year more than three years continuously tax non-resident. So in the past, in the year you tax immigrated, we had to do a TCS tax immigration clearance as the first process, okay? Provide balance sheets, make sure you have good standing. Okay. Then four years later, or three tax years later, then I had to do it again because now you can cash because the fund wants a very new current year that's valid still for 12 months. Now it's far easier. And my fees has dropped to my clients because now I can say to them, just get the letter. Let's just do the letter. And if you don't want to encash your, uh, if you don't want to send money out of the country, Just want to double check um, if the the stuttering is on my end or if it's on Hugo's end. If somebody can maybe, could you? Yes, I see. Linda says it's coming through very distorted. Hugo, so I don't know if you can hear me, but um, I think there's maybe an issue. Can somebody just confirm <laughs> if everything is okay from my end when I'm talking, uh, just so that we can make sure. Um, and the beauty of live television, right? So it's absolutely amazing. While we sort this out, uh, I do just, uh, there is a sound challenge. Yeah, um, Yichu is rapping. Okay, is Francois rapping as well? <laughs> right, so so I'm going to continue as if as if everything's okay on my end. Uh, thank you very much, Albert. So um, just why are these things important that we are talking about uh, with Yichu? Because... Um, with Hihu, uh, you know, some of these things I think sounds very, very uh, technical and it sounds very, um, it, it sounds very like, well, this is not my domain, you know, I'm a financial planner, why is this important? And from my point of view, where I'm sitting is that if there's one thing that, that, that we as financial planners need to, to, to bring to the table with these things, because remember, in, in my view anyway, I don't know how you feel about this, but, but in my view, we are really like the center point or the linchpin or the 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 thing the the sort of glue that holds everything together and we must be able to ask these questions and we must be able to know what whoa you who said that there's this just ask the question so it's not to that we need that technical expertise so much it is about being aware so that you know you can ask the right questions uh, and that you know when 
something does go wrong because often clients go to other professionals and they come back and you hear of this afterwards and then you can ask questions you know when they are having trouble etc at least there's an awareness around this and i think that is that is the main idea uh with what we're trying to do i I'm see you, you are back i see you yeah. back <laughs> if i can add to that comment um where i really need because i am not a financial planner as you know not registered and nearly 60 they no intention to register and um, I know you mentioned Quibus is in Japan, so I'm going to use his name if he allows me. Um, we've had very interesting cases with clients. So one of the things where I'm giving a tax opinion and it impacts on the product that you provide or the solution you provide. Okay, Because, for example, America hates South African unit trusts. It's a PFIC and they tax the capital gains tax in the unit trust, which we don't in South Africa. The second part is when a South African is living abroad in a country like the UAE, where there's no personal tax, we have comp income tax on one June, we start income tax on companies, but we have no tax on individuals. Then these so-called, and I don't know exactly what you call it, sinking funds or wrapper funds, where it's a five-year product and the fund, you pay the tax within the fund. So now you're paying 30%, okay? Income tax and 12% capital gains tax. For someone living in South Africa, extremely tax efficient, but for someone living outside South Africa, not that tax efficient, where his tax rate is less than 12% on capital gains tax. Mm. Okay. okay. So unfortunately, I then have to say, the other part that I still see is that South Africans have this notion, and they go to the banks, not so much to financial planners, and they go and sit at the branch and say, I now live abroad, I want something that is tax-free, so give me a tax-free savings. And they don't need the tax-free savings. Their normal unit trust is by a principle tax-free. And the dividends tax is unfortunately payable. That's the one that stays. But you don't necessarily need to go into a share-based um, tax-free investment. But you don't really need a tax-free investment as a South African. If you're doing it for your children because they're going back, it's not a problem. The other part then is the insurance for what we call um, and I don't know if you in the industry call it the same, the life cover to pay a state duty, okay, which you must make payable to the um, estate so that the if you have you are asset rich but cash poor, those must stay in place even though you tax immigrate. Because remember, someone who is treaty based non resident, someone living in the UAE that has a three year, two year renewable visa, they will have to pay state duty should they die. There's no capital gains tax and there's no donations tax, but they are subject to state duty. So they must continue with the insurance product to make sure that they have adequate cash to pay the estate duty. And why is that so important? We have just seen it. It was mentioned earlier today. To give you an idea, when I arrived in the UAE 1 May 2019, the Durham to the Rand was 365. This morning, I see now, right now, it's trading at 5 Rand 39, okay? Which means your South African estate duty on your bank account, very little interest here because we're dollar-based. We link to the dollar, okay? The estate dutiable value has just nearly doubled or was about to double, okay? So please, for the uh, financial planners, when your client says to you he wants to stop his retirement annuities because he has no longer a deduction and it becomes an estate dutiable, then the immediate discussion is, don't we now need life cover to protect you for that um, estate duty? And I mean, that that's the important part, right? I think these things move so quickly at the moment and we don't necessarily sit down just to think, well, you know, what are the risks that's now come about? I don't even want to call them opportunities because they are obviously opportunities from a financial planning point of view. But it is important to say, whoa, my client's risk has just increased significantly. You know, what is happening? Um, and, and just to make sure that we have these conversations with them. Um, you said something earlier that, that sort of triggered a next question with me that you said like your salary, for example, is not subject to tax in, in Dubai and all of that. So it makes me think of the, you know, remember a few years ago, the only thing that we spoke about was the foreign employment income exemption, those changes with a million coming in and then the 1.25 and it was, ah, oh, but it's not just the cash part, it's the remuneration and definition and all those good conversations we had. I, I mean, then comes along just as we get used to the new regime and how that exemption now works and everybody's fine along comes the pandemic 
and people come home. People that were earning money overseas suddenly had to come home or I don't know, maybe they couldn't work or whatever the case might have been. Um, and suddenly that 180 days, 60 days, all of those rules <clears throat> gets broken probably. I don't know. I'm assuming. Um, I, I'm so glad I don't have a tax practice anymore. But the, um, I mean, what is the, what is the impact? Has there been an impact on that specifically? So South Africans working overseas uh, who relied on that exemption and now suddenly they couldn't or was that not even an issue? Yeah, it was a big, big issue. It remains an issue because what happened is that for the two tax years directly impacted by COVID-19 and the lockdowns, okay, um, they reduced the 183 days to 117 days. But now in the 22 and 23 tax years, um, it is back to 183 days and you must be more than 60 days out of South Africa for a continuous period and it must be an employment. You can't go on holiday. You must be employed for that 60 days. And um, we still have areas where people could not fly, like China stopped their flights. I had the same issue here in Dubai. So you remember there was a period that everybody felt so sorry for me, but I made the decision to stay here because if I went back to South Africa, I would fail my 183 days. Emirates said no more flights to South Africa. Then a month later, they said, okay, we'll fly you to Joburg, but no one could fly out of South Africa. So I had to make the decision to stay here to make sure I meet my 183 days because of the fact that if once I was back in South Africa to get back into Dubai, I had to go to another country and spend a week to two weeks or 10 days in another country before I could come back to the UAE. So I've had very good success. I would say about 60 to 70% of the people that couldn't make the exact days, but then they were very close, like 179 or things like that, or 160, that's the lowest I've had. Then we go back to SARS and we give them the press release from the airline like in China, saying that people can't leave or can't come in. Because in Interpretation Note 16, Issue 4, they state that if there was incidental days in South Africa, they won't hold it against you. So when you initially fill in the form, they then unfortunately decline and you have to do an objection. So <clears throat> I have had up to 60 to 70 percent success rate. Those that are not successful, we on objection or appeal stage, and I believe we'll make we'll have some success. But it remains until today a big issue. And remember, the other part, as you mentioned, is that it's the 1.25 includes all your allowances. And what people forget there is that the document, the frequent asked questions, they must go and look at that document as well, because the exemption is proportionally apportioned between the various allowances. OK, which means that you the, for the people pay, paying tax in the UK, the credit they can deduct in South Africa is less. OK, mm. so there could be a shortfall purely because of the tax. And then the other problem we have is that, and, and but SARS is now catching up. Kazakhstan, you do not file a tax return. Your employer deducts 10 percent flat and that's a final tax. Now, SARS wants a proof from the foreign tax authority. But individuals do not register for tax there. It's a final assessment as your payslip. And then we get a letter from the employer and say, that is the system. And um, I've recently seen one of my clients, I got involved at the later stage when it was really filed. He took one of the big five guys' um, uh, tax summaries and he screen printed that and gave to SARS. Okay. Um, but unfortunately, for example, the 10% on his um, uh, in South Africa traveling allowance was then reduced because remember we only allow 80 percent you only pay on 80 percent of that so they only took eight percent instead of ten percent and i had to say to them it's not worth objecting that is the practice also very important just remember practice is not necessarily law you can go and object you can go to court but for two percent tax on your traveling allowance your attorney is going to be much more so i advise the client and you know me like that i am risk averse it's just um, I would love to fight with SARS. You know I like doing a fight. But there's sometimes when you must look at the cost and just say to the client, sorry, it's just not worth it. Yeah, so no, the sure, other geez. issue, it's now <clears throat> three tax years later and the 1.25 has not been increased. And just to give you, an, an, when, when in 2019, 2020, when this was announced, for the South Africans, we were probably at about 390 to the dirham. We now today at 539. So the 1.25 in hard currency is substantially less. So I suddenly have people like onboard crew, you know, the, the uh, air stewards and so on, 
that are now have to pay tax in South Africa. In the past, it was only pilots because the um, aircraft people had, you know, the, the back team, um, uh, back of the aircraft team had lower incomes. But now it's a big issue. And, you know, the um, we in South Africa would love that. Uh, Dubai is a buzz. Um, Emirates gave half year bonus. So everybody today gets a check or money into the account, half of the annual salary as a bonus. Um, Etihad, I think, was um, 22 weeks. So it's substantial bonuses. So all the money they lost, no, not all, but a big part of the money they lost in COVID when they were not flying is now paid back. For those, sadly, for those pilots who are still here. Those who lost their jobs are not getting that. It's very sad. Yeah, but that's, uh, and it just shows you again how quickly, I mean, it's, it's almost like if your income doubled just because of the, the depreciation in the RAND, uh, of which you've got no control over, it suddenly means it's almost like halving your exemption. You know, it's like almost yeah. the, 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 the same thing. Um, so you know, we've got two minutes. I, I just want to quickly mention when I raised this with Treasury beginning of the year when we were discussing past budget, their comment was as your taxable income doubles so that your pay as you earn credit. So that applies to people in the UK or US where they're paying in Australia, where they're paying similar tax rates to us. But for those living in Guernsey, Jersey, uh, Dubai, it's not. Yeah, and that's the important thing, right? And and I think still the, the the other big thing is just realizing that you still need to submit a tax return here when you're making use of that. And you're not a non-resident. You're not out of South Africa. You may think you are, but you're not because you're coming back. So um, those are the important things. Uh, I've now got one and a half minutes. Um, I want to ask you, there's one important question I want to ask you quickly before we end off. And this is, for those people who went through the formal immigration, financial immigration process before, um, is there anything that they need to do right now? I suggest do get that letter, the new format letter. Okay, it's not an absolute requirement because we understand in the guidelines that that old TC, TC the tax immigration letter of the formal immigration will suffice to go on to the international transfer. But if you're not doing an international transfer, go and get that letter because it's just refreshing it and showing to them that you're out of the country. Amazingness. Hiku, um, I'm going to put all your details down below in the description. Uh, I think I might have already, but I'll just go double check. Um, and then if people want to get in touch, the best place is just connect with Hiku on LinkedIn. He's very active on LinkedIn as well. Uh, easy to find. And if you can't find him, find me and I will put you in touch with Hiku. So that's not a problem. And at the all. social media at Vachkaner still stays. So I'm not yes. killing that. So it's at Vachkaner. Fantastic. Thank you. Fantastic. And good luck and enjoy your weekend. Thank you, Francois. Thank you very much, Ichu. I really appreciate you and everything you do. Uh, keep doing the right stuff for the right reason, with the right intent, like you've always done. Really appreciate it. Alrighty, so fantastic. Thank you very much, Ichu. That was an amazing conversation. It always is, and we didn't have enough time, and I've even created more time. Like we started at 25 past seven, oh, 25 past eight already, instead of uh, the usual half past uh, eight or uh, what's it? Yeah, half past eight. Um, so the lucky draw for hashtag coffee tax. If you haven't got it in yet, uh, you can just comment hashtag coffee tax. We've got 20 entries in the draw. And uh, as I said before, this is a live draw. Unfortunately, I don't have my music or my hand claps or whatever today because I'm obviously not in my studio. But uh, let's do this. Uh, remember the rule is if you won in the last, uh, we got to change it from six months to three months because it feels like a, an eternity for people who won right in the beginning. So, uh, you can only win once in three months. Uh, this is completely automated. It's completely um out of my hands <clears throat> so uh, let's see who wins and maybe i can't even remember if you won already like i'm going to try and remember but let's see so here we go uh let's see who will win our coffee today and i will be sending you a little video clip and uh, all of that harry nell cake no net harry have you won before i don't think so um, so, Harry, I will uh, get in touch and uh, I will send you all the things that you need to do in order to claim your coffee. So, big congratulations and well done. Then, uh, to end off with uh, my guests next week, 
is uh, Ryan, Diane, and uh, Yondela. So those will be the first three. Uh, I want to call them youngsters. They are our future heroes, uh, and I want to. I'm going to interview them next week. Uh, so do join us next week live. It's going to be incredible just to hear their journey, how they got in, what they find challenging, what's amazing, and everything in between. So I really look forward to these sessions. So thank you to all of them for getting in touch with me and being willing to put themselves out there and come and have a chat with us. And that's that. Now I'm on my way to Divil, Durbanville. I've got a few people I need to go and see there. So uh, I'm going to leave now. But thank you very much for joining us. Uh, stay safe, be blessed and prosper. And continue to raise the bar. Thank you very much. I love you lots. Bye-bye.